Welcome to a world where nothing is quite as it seems. Welcome to fake Britain. Here at the fake Britain house, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous. And we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, the fake sunglasses that could harm your health. I was absolutely devastated. We didn't realise that I would have to lose all of the eye. The puppies with fake identities being trafficked into the country. And they came and collected him and took him away. And we have a close shave with fake razor blades. It was tugging and it was tearing at my, at my skin, at my hairs, and I, I just had to stop immediately. Designer sunglasses can be expensive, but you're paying for the brand and the quality of the lenses. They'll offer high levels of protection from the damaging effects of the sun's ultraviolet light. These say 100% UV protection. Unfortunately, I can't believe that, because these and all the other sunglasses here are fake. If you bought these, you might not only waste your money, but also damage your eyes. Deborah Kane from Manchester believes she knows all about the dangers of fake sunglasses. When she was in her teens and 20s, like many people at the time, Deborah was less concerned about the dangers of UV exposure. She spent her summers topping up her tan in sunny holiday destinations. Deb and her friends were on a heat-seeking mission for the perfect tan. No pain, no gain. You knew you were catching the sun because you could feel it burning you and you'd be there thinking, oh, this is great because I am getting a tan and I know even though I'm going to burn, I will get a little bit of colour. As well as chasing the sun, Deb was keen to hunt down the best deal possible on fake designer sunglasses. We used to um, bargain with the, um, the guys on holiday to get as many different pairs off them as possible for the cheapest possible price so that we could have um, a Chanel pair, a Dolce & Gabbana pair, um, Armani pair, as many pairs as we want. A few years later, though, Deb started to have a problem with her eyesight. I started getting double vision in my eye and then um, went to the hospital. They had a look inside my eye and decided there was something pretty serious in there. So I went and had a scan done privately and um, it was malignant melanoma. Deb had an ocular melanoma, a rare type of cancer that develops in the eye. I was absolutely devastated. And at the time when they first told me, um, we didn't realise that I would have to lose all of the eye. Deb's eye cancer was so dangerously close to her brain that there was only one option. Had two doctors that did it, very, really brilliant doctors. Um, that I wouldn't be here without them. They took my eye out and um, the rest, I suppose, is history. Long-term exposure to UV light is known to damage our eyes in many ways and can increase the risks of cataracts, the leading cause of blindness. Cancers of the eyelid are also linked to exposure to UV light. Deb believes her eye cancer was due to excessive exposure to UV light caused by wearing fake sunglasses on holiday. I do think that there is a link between wearing fake sunglasses and um, me and myself getting uh, a malignant melanoma. We wanted to find out more about the possible links between long-term ultraviolet exposure and serious eye damage. So we spoke to Dr Mandeep Sagu, a leading eye surgeon specialising in eye tumours and ocular melanoma. UV light exposure in early life may lead to problems in later life. The effects of UV light on our eyes are being widely researched, and some of the conclusions are worrying. Our ocular melanoma is generally melanoma which is on the inside of the eye, and there are studies out of Australia which have suggested a link between UV light exposure and the development of, of melanoma. When it comes to being out in bright sunlight, the medical advice is clear. Sunglasses are used to do a particular job. 
one of the key ways of protecting yourself from UV light exposure to the eye is to wear good sunglasses that have the correct UV light blocking properties. Fake sunglasses may uh, end up letting in UV light which over a prolonged period could cause damage. If you're going to use sunglasses then they should be ones with genuine UV protection. And the sunglass business is booming. We spend over 300 million pounds a year on sunglasses, so the profits to be made are pretty clear to the fakers. John Jacobs from Scambusters Southwest has been at the centre of one of the largest fake sunglasses operation he's ever had to deal with. If you can imagine a place similar to this, it was a huge warehouse with wall-to-wall -wall fake goods. This is the largest quantity of fake sunglasses that we found in one seizure. Somewhere in the region of 8,000 different sunglasses, and we've got Ray-Ban, Gucci, Marc Jacobs, uh, Cartier. As John discovered, these sunglasses were a cut above the usual knockdown fakes. Well, here you have what appears to be a genuine pair of Cartier sunglasses. They're set in a Cartier box. Within the box is also the pouch and the documentation that goes with them. Quite impressive as you look at it. Looks like the genuine article. If I saw that for sale, then I would consider that to be the genuine article. And being able to dupe online buyers into thinking these high-end fakes were the real deal was exactly what the fakers were banking on. By selling fake sunglasses online at close to the price of the genuine article, the fakers were making huge profits. In total, the value of the fake goods that we seized was well over a million pounds. Over a six-month period from one site that these fake sunglasses were being sold on, the criminals generated over 160,000 pounds. So you can see how large a scale of problem this was and the amount, the quantity of fake products being put out to the public. Darren Ward and Timothy Tivney later pleaded guilty to unauthorised use of trademarks. Ward was given a 13-month suspended sentence and Tivney a year's community order with unpaid work. In this major case of sunglass fakery, John was concerned about more than just trademark infringement. Claims about UV protection meant that these fake sunglasses could have posed a public safety risk. This booklet says the high quality Cartier sunglasses have been carefully selected to ensure excellent eye protection and maximum visual comfort. If that is not accurate, which we believe it not to be because it's a fake document, then there's a potential of causing long lasting damage to your eyes through unprotected UVA UVB rays coming through. Fake sunglasses like the ones seized in this raid are turning up all over the country. Paul Wright from Staffordshire Scientific Services is in charge of testing fake sunglasses that have been seized by his local trading standards team. Many of them carry fake CE and ultraviolet safety markings. When you see a CE mark on a sample, you presume that they have been tested and been shown to be safe. That is not always the case. Anyone can put a CE mark on a piece of equipment. There has to be something to back it up. Ultraviolet light from the sun is invisible light that's more powerful than what we see and potentially damaging to our eyes. Genuine sunglasses should block out some of this light and protect our eyes. Fake sunglasses might not. Paul will measure how much UV light passes through a pair of genuine glasses and a pair of fakes using this UV visible spectrophotometer. First up, the genuine sunglasses. A line should be drawn on this uh, graph here, which will indicate the amount of light being transmitted through the lens of the glasses. If the sunglasses have adequate UV protection, this red line should begin to fall when it reaches the potentially harmful UV zone on the left of the screen. And this is what we're finding. Little or no light is passing through these lenses in the UV, UVB and UVC regions. So these genuine sunglasses should protect the eyes of the person wearing them. 
What about the fakes? As we reach the ultraviolet region, light is being transmitted through the lenses. Paul's suspicions about the fake sunglasses are confirmed. And in fact, 23.6% of UV air light is passing through. These lenses do not provide adequate protection to the wearer. The consumer is at a greater risk. And Deb's not taking any more risks. These days, when she goes out in the sun, she makes sure she wears genuine glasses. Fake sunglasses shouldn't be allowed. It's shocking what they can do to your eyes. If I knew now what was going to happen, I definitely would never have taken the chance of wearing them. Meet Joe and Princess. Very handsome little doggies, aren't they? They're Maltese Terriers, which is a very popular and valuable breed, and they're worth around £1,200 each. They're both going to have one of these put under their skin. It's a microchip which proves who they are, so that their age and their inoculations can be confirmed. But what if the chip wasn't proving their identity, but faking it? What if it came from a completely different dog? It's the puppy smuggler's latest con. Joe and Princess's chip information will be genuine. But has your puppies been faked? <laughs> this is undercover footage of illegal puppy traffickers in Eastern Europe. This woman is responsible for smuggling around a thousand puppies into Britain each year, earning herself tens of thousands of pounds. <laughs> In a new ruse, illegal breeders are faking the identities of underage puppies to defeat UK border controls. Many of these puppies will be sold to unsuspecting British buyers. Dog lover Sharon Fitzpatrick found out what the puppy identity fakers are up to the very hard way. We've been talking about getting another puppy for quite a while. Um, we both, me and my partner, like British Bulldogs and French Bulldogs. French Bulldogs are one of Britain's most popular dog breeds, with over 5,000 new registrations each year. When Sharon spotted this little fella online, she thought she'd found the family pooch of her dreams. Sharon did background checks on the puppy and was told he was a six-month-old British-born dog with a microchip, passport and all his vaccinations. We paid £2,000 for him because, as far as we were concerned, we wanted dog from a reputable breeder. Hugo quickly became one of the family. Just fell in love with him straight away. He was just the right one for us. So it was just so nice. But Sharon's joy with the new housemate, Hugo, was to be short-lived. He started coughing. And then Sunday lunchtime, he was really sniffly, runny nose, really not himself, very lethargic, wouldn't play, which is not a puppy. Sharon rushed Hugo to the local vet, who could immediately see that Hugo was just nine weeks old. The vet scanned Hugo's microchip. He came back in and told us, sorry, but this puppy's been imported. Bizarrely, Hugo's microchip showed that he was a six-month-old Hungarian dog, not a nine-week-old British puppy. His chip had been switched to smuggle him into the country. He'd been given a fake identity. And now, he had pneumonia. That was very emotional. I cried because we'd gone into the vets with a puppy and walking out with nothing. And it's just a horrible thought and having to go home and tell the children that we've no longer got a puppy at the moment because he's very ill. And it was very touch and go then if he was going to come home or not. Fortunately, Hugo did pull through. But Sharon's ordeal wasn't over. I get a phone call from Trading Standards to say I'm really sorry but we have to come and get Hugo because he has to go into proper quarantine because he's been illegally imported. And they came and collected him and took him away. Sorry. And that was just heart-wrenching because this was just all before Christmas. And it ruined our Christmas. You've got an empty cage sat in the corner and no Hugo. Upsetting as it was for Sharon, trading standards had good reason to rush Hugo into quarantine near Bristol. For kennel owner Meg Purnell Carpenter, it was a matter of national public health. Hugo could have had rabies, 
um, and nobody would have found out about it. And what is worrying is Hugo is only one of hundreds of puppies like this. In fact, thousands of puppies with fake identities are being trafficked into Britain each year. Under the pet travel scheme, puppies are implanted with microchips, which show where the puppy comes from. The chip number matches the number in the puppy passport. That shows how old the dog is and what jabs it's had. Puppies have to be at least 15 weeks old to enter Britain. Any younger and their rabies vaccines are ineffective. But the fakers know that younger, cute puppies can be worth thousands more than older dogs. They've found a way to smuggle underage puppies into the country, cutting costs by not having them vaccinated. And that's what happened to Hugo. The microchip was taken out of a six-month-old puppy and then implanted into Hugo, making it a fake identity microchip, and Hugo's a fake. In Hugo's case, the fakers gave him the microchip of a six-month-old dog to circumvent the system and get the young pup into the country. The Dogs Trust is the UK's largest dog welfare charity. They're so concerned about the trafficking of puppies with fake identities that they sent investigators to Eastern Europe to secretly film illegal breeders preparing puppies with microchips ready for export. Many of the dogs destined for trafficking were being held in appalling conditions before embarking on their arduous journey to be sold. Paula Boyden is a qualified vet and veterinary director of the Dogs Trust. She's worried about the routine switching of microchips. So this is a microchip. You can see it's a little bigger than a, a grain of rice. Um, and it's amazing that something this small is, is actually leading on to, to the, you know, the forgery of all of this information. It's worrying that the, the whole microchip situation, which is a means to try and identify individuals, again, is just being totally abused. Paula showed us some undercover footage of an illegal puppy breeder. What we've got here is one of our Hungarian breeders that was actually implanting a puppy with a microchip. But do these illegal breeders know what they're doing? <laughs> the puppy is certainly in some distress while she's doing that. Microchip implantation should only be done by a qualified person, but illegal breeders like this are prepared to teach other DIY breeders, or in this case, undercover investigators, how to do it, if the price is right. We were given instructions of how to implant the microchip. Now, again, from a veterinary surgeon's perspective, that's incredibly worrying. We're implanting the microchip in between the shoulder blades at the back of the neck. Too deep, you're straight into the spinal canal. By swapping microchips from dog to dog, illegal breeders aren't just changing the ages of trafficked puppies. They're faking where they come from to make them more desirable. If you want an Irish microchip, that is a 10,000 more. Irish or German registered microchips are more highly prized than those from Eastern Europe, as buyers often assume Irish or German puppies are in better condition with a better lineage. By swapping microchips around, this puppy identity faker is making a killing. This one individual is responsible for almost a thousand puppies a year coming into the UK. An individual bringing five puppies a week into the UK could easily be making in excess of £100,000 per year. And there's a risk of disease to the British public from trafficked puppies that haven't had their vaccinations. A worrying disease is a tapeworm called Echinococcus. Um, now, again, this is zoonotic. It can affect you and I. Um, it really is quite a nasty disease. The tapeworm will insist in organs such as the liver, which will significantly affect an individual's quality of life and their lifespan. Echinococcus is already kicking at the, the shores of France. And again, it's not a disease that we want to have in the country. Back at the kennels, it's a big day for Sharon. Hi, I'm Meg. Big day's a cut. I know, Why? I can't wait. <laughs> She's about to be reunited with puppy Hugo after a five-week wait. Hugo! Get you sit there, baby! Sit there! Hello, gorgeous. But you smell gorgeous. You had a bath. We can now register him officially with pet log, so then he's now registered to me and he'll be our dog forever. And he's not a fake anymore. And he's no longer a fake. Male grooming is booming. 
Over 160 million quid is spent every year on the best selling brand of razor alone, all in the pursuit of a smoother, closer, cut free shave. But if you were spending your money on these, you'd be in trouble because you've just had a close shave with the fakers. Gillette razors are one of Britain's biggest and best selling brands of disposable wet razor. Since they hit our shelves in 1980s, 100 million Gillette blades are now sold each year in Britain. Made for men, but also borrowed by wives, girlfriends and daughters, Mac blades are amongst the country's most shoplifted items. They don't come cheap at around £10 for a pack of four. And the fakers want a slice of the profits, as lifelong wet shaver Andy Green discovered. I do spend a lot of money on blades. I always try to buy the latest blade innovation, if you like. One day, Andy received an email from an established online retailer offering him nine Gillette Mac 3 blades with a razor handle for 15 quid. It was a few pounds less than he'd expected to pay on the high street. So, Andy bought them. When the blades arrived, the packaging looked fine. I had no cause to assume that there was anything wrong with them. The company I bought them from, I'd bought from before and been very happy with my purchases. Andy didn't give the razor blades a second thought until the morning of his next shave. So I opened the packet, put the fresh blade in the handle, I lathered my face and um, I started to shave. But there was a catch. And I noticed immediately it was tugging and it was tearing at my, at my skin, at my hairs. And I, I just had to stop immediately. I knew there was something wrong. The blades weren't cutting it. When you're having your hairs tugged rather than cut out of your face, it is quite a painful experience. The feel of the blade I was using was really uncomfortable. Compare that to the blade I was used to and the blade I was expecting, which gives a nice, smooth, lubricated cut. This was nothing like that. My feelings were one of anger. Um, having been sold blades that weren't fit for purpose and they could quite easily have cut me. There was only one thing for it. Andy sent the razor blades to Procter & Gamble who manufacture Gillette razor blades. They stated that these razor blades were indeed fake. I was really angry. I'm quite shocked that these fake razor blades are being sold online. They weren't a bit cheaper than retail but not enough to make me think they were dodgy or fake. Fake Britain wanted to know what a shaving expert would make of the fake razor blades that Andy bought. So we took some identical fake blades to Parser Rad, whose shaving skills are a cut above those of the average male groomer. He's been crowned Britain's fastest wet shaver. He can shave a man in under a minute. Parser uses only the sharpest, genuine blades. About the fakes, he's pretty blunt. The sub script has just been completely um, split to two and the blades are uneven as well so they're gonna they're gonna catch the skin and they're gonna strip the skin off so we shall see and fake Britain did want to see so we asked Parser to put the fake razor blades to the test alongside the real ones with a bit of help from our beardy assistant the right side of our brave subjects face will be shaved with a genuine blade and the left side with the fake First up, Parser gets to grips with the genuine razor blade. It's very smooth, and you can see the results, how it's taking all the beards off. It's without any damage to the skin. But what about the fake? I have to be very, very careful and gentle. It's already pulling. You can see that they're not, they're not shaving everything off. It's an immediate fail for this fake blade. It's a grazer, not a razor. It's not even shaving. If, if I'm going to push it from here, the client is start jumping. So uh, you can see that's a very, very big difference. Even I'm stretching the skin, it just leaves the, the, the beard behind. The quality of the shave on this side, it's a very huge difference to the other side. Parser is left having to tidy up fake Britain's rather patchy researcher with his own cutthroat razor. I would definitely not recommend these to use um, at home because they're quite dangerous. Fake Britain wanted to find out more about the international trade in fake razor blades. 
So we spoke to Francis Chalk from Bristol Trading Standards. He's been leading an investigation into a woman called Jocelyn Hunter and one of the country's largest fake razor blade cases. What Jocelyn Hunter was doing was acting as the middleman or go-between between the factories in China and the eventual customers in Europe, such as other retailers in places like Germany, Italy, Lithuania, Poland. Um, and it was seen as a lot easier to get goods into the UK first and then export them out into Europe rather than send them from China directly into Europe. But Francis's team was on to Hunter. They intercepted a shipment of fake razor blades at Coventry Postal Hub, which led them to a suburban street in Wiltshire. We were surprised by the sheer volume of fake razor blades that were basically being controlled from one small house in Swindon. We've got 46 parcels here, and there's one email which talks about almost 200,000 boxes, which we conservatively have estimated a value of two and a half million pounds. It was one of the largest seizures of fake razor blades ever made in the UK. It wasn't just the scale of the operation that was impressive. The quality of the packaging of the fake blades was like nothing trading standards had ever seen before. So this is a fake set of blades in my right hand. In my left hand, I've got a genuine set of blades. When you look at the packaging, it's very difficult to tell them apart. And if you saw that in isolation, you would never know that was fake. And the faker's attention to detail continued beneath the packaging. The quality of these fakes is very, very good. It does really take an expert to tell them apart. To the untrained eye, you'd never be able to tell the difference between them and the real thing. You do have to be almost impressed that they are such good copies. Trading standards finally had enough evidence to arrest and charge Hunter. Francis Chalk was at court for the final verdict. I've just come from Swindon Crown Court where Jocelyn Hunter has been sentenced for 15 months for selling fake razor blades. It really does reflect that the gravity of the offences that she was involved in, selling these fake products that could potentially be dangerous and also insanitary. These fake razor blades were seized before they could do any damage. But Fake Britain wanted to find out how easy it might be to buy others. We bought 32 Gillette Fusion power cartridges from an internet seller for around £45, a tempting bargain at around half the price of the high street. We sent the blades to James Williams at Procter & Gamble for analysis. He confirmed that the blades we bought were fake. There's only one way to see the real difference between our fake blades and the genuine article. Under 1,000 times magnification on an electron microscope, the difference is stark. What you see is the real Gillette razor blade here with a clean, consistent and razor-sharp edge that's actually thinner than a surgeon's scalpel. As opposed to on the counterfeit, we see this jagged, uneven edge which is going to give a very poor shave, much more chance of nicks, cuts. I think when you see this razor blade, people will be shocked at what they might be able to get hold of if they buy a counterfeit product. It looks dangerous and it is dangerous. You wouldn't want to shave with it. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.